Good morning. Welcome to Summit Drive Church online. Thanks for joining us today. I'm just going to start off by sharing some things happening in our life and community this morning. If you have any needs or know of someone who does, we would love for you to connect with the office so we can help support financially or with practical help. Please contact us if you know of a need that we can help meet as a church during this time. If you would like to give, you can check the description below for a link or drop it by the church office. Any giving for the 2020 year must be into the office or through PayPal by December 31st. You can drop it in the mail slot in the door in front of the church. There will be limited office hours for the upcoming week. You can see the bulletin for more details on those hours. Now you're probably wondering by now why I am holding these flowers. And unfortunately this morning we are saying goodbye to one of our staff members. So this is uh, Miss Maddie here as the kids know her. Maddie has been a part of our church community for a long time. She's not going anywhere, she's staying here in Kamloops. She started as a volunteer, she worked as a summer intern for several summers, and she's been on staff as a permanent part-time staff member in children's ministry. And um, she, many of you maybe don't know this, but she has been going to school to be a teacher, and starting in January, she is gonna be moving in, into the classroom full-time for her practicum. And so her um, time here with us as a staff member is coming to a close, but she's still, her and her husband, Mixon, who's on the drums back there, they're still gonna be here in Kamloops, and so you might still see her around. So these are for you, Maddie, and that's a card for you as well. Thank you so much. And you can join me now in a time of prayer, and we will pray for Maddie as well this morning. All right, let's pray. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God, we know that many of us have probably had trouble rejoicing at times in 2020 and are maybe not sad to see this year drawing to a close. But God, we also know that you are still God and that you are in control, even in the midst of challenging times. We thank you for the Christmas season that reminds us of who you are and why you came to earth as a baby. This season reminds us to place our focus where it should be, on you. So we ask God as we enter into a new year with still a lot of uncertainty and unknowns for the coming year, that you would draw us to yourself. That 2021 would be a year marked by spiritual growth as we draw closer to you as individuals and as a community and as we learn to trust you more. God, we pray for Maddie as she moves into a new area of ministry in 2021 by stepping into a classroom full time. We ask that you would bless her in this coming year and provide her with everything she needs to be able to complete her degree and prepare to be a teacher in her own classroom. God, we pray that you would use her in a powerful way to be a great influence for you in the lives of each student that she teaches. We pray also for the COVID situation going into 2021. We thank you that vaccines are beginning to be used and distribution plans are being formed. God, we pray that those who most need these vaccines would be able to gain access to them quickly and that you would give us all continued wisdom and patience as we wait and hope for the end of this pandemic. We don't know what things will look like in our church or in our community in 2021, but God, we pray that you would prepare us to be your hands and your feet in whatever way is needed in this coming year. We pray for those in our midst who are struggling with health concerns. We pray for Carol as she recovers from a broken hip, for Judy who is beginning chemo, for a young father recuperating at home for a young man recently diagnosed with leukemia, and for Brian and Len fighting cancer. God, you are the great physician, and we ask for your healing and comfort for each of these people. We thank you for Liji, our family of the week, and our sister in you. God, we pray that you would be with her in this coming year 
that she would find joy in your presence, that you would provide for her every need, and that she would be able to share your love with those around her. We thank you for Kamloops Vineyard Christian Fellowship and for Cornerstone Evangelical Church in Richmond. God, we pray that these churches would survive and thrive during this pandemic, that you would give them creative solutions to problems that arise, and that they would be able to continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus to their communities. Please be with our brothers and sisters in Somalia and Yemen. We pray that the believers in their communities would be protected and strengthened by you and by fellowship with one another to continue to boldly proclaim your name amidst persecution. And God, we pray for their persecutors, that you would break through the darkness in their hearts and that they would see the light of Christ. We commit the rest of this service to you now. We ask God that you would meet us as we continue to worship you through song and through the preaching of your word. Don't yet let your words fall on deaf ears, but open our hearts and minds to hear what you want to say to us this morning. Amen. Thanks so much, Jill. If you're new to Summit, online. <laughs> My name is Dave. I'm our lead pastor here. And uh, every now and again, I have the joy of being able to lead and celebrating through music. And that's what we're about to do is to join our hearts in song in a moment here. But you know, this morning we're talking about freedom, which might seem ironic <laughs> in the midst of a pandemic when most of us are feeling maybe less than free in some ways. But you know, the way that God teaches us and defines freedom is different than we often do. We often think of freedom as, well, it's the ability to do whatever I want whenever I want to. But that's really naive to the complexities of what real freedom is. It doesn't uh, think about our neighbor or how we're interacting with other people, which is much more in line with what God tells us about freedom, that we were created to live free, but that freedom is to be used actually in service to others. It means being free from self-centeredness, uh, free from what the Bible describes as sin, which is living for me and my goals and de-godding God in my heart. When Jesus was in a conversation with some leaders who um, were not very keen on what he was teaching, he tells them this. He says, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's what I want us to focus in on now in these next moments here. That the son, Jesus himself, came for freedom's sake. To free us from bondage. Bondage to that self-centered sin nature. Bondage to the enemy himself. To free us for this reason. Here's what Paul says in Galatians 5. It's for freedom that you've been set free, but don't use it as an opportunity for self-indulgence. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So this morning, let's fix our eyes on. Let's turn our attention toward. Let's give all praise to the one who truly sets us free. Would you join in wherever you are with us now? Come to the well that never runs dry Drink of the water, come and thirst no more Come all you sinners, come find his mercy Come to the table, he will satisfy Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Put up. 
I want to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. My name is Gerald, and I'm the director of worship here at Summit Drive. And wherever you're tuning in today, we are so glad that you're able to join us and join in community with us, and that we can gather together in this way. Now, if you've been here before, you may have noticed that a lot of times it's me that's walking down up to the music and Pastor Dave that's coming up to deliver the message, but we thought we'd switch roles today just for fun. Now, in addition to directing worship here at the church, for the past four years I've had another job that has allowed me several hours each day to listen. A lot of times it's music, but also I've listened to a lot of podcasts and sermons, and as a result, I've been able to gather material from respected pastors and scholars and teachers of the Bible to put together some material for us to look at together today. And to clarify, I've spent a lot of time listening, not talking till now, so get comfortable. And just over a month ago, I awoke with this image in my head that I couldn't shake. I don't know exactly why, but the scenario is this. It's the outset of our Christmas Eve service, and in utter darkness, my good friend Perry breaks the silence with the iconic bass line from Fleetwood Mac's hit song, The Chain. Since I normally wake up with not much of anything going on in my head, I thought this might be a noteworthy idea. As we talked about the song, we recognized that it's really a song about shattered expectations, which kind of ties into how 2020 has gone for some people. Now, if you're thinking you've heard something like this before recently, I'm kind of paraphrasing our message from the Christmas Eve service. But this past year has been disruptive in a lot of ways for a lot of people, hasn't it? And our natural response, when we feel like we're losing control, might be to close our fists and try desperately to cling to what we're losing. 
and to regain what we've lost. Or even, even if, as the song suggests, it feels like a chain. Two days before recording for Christmas Eve, it was suggested that we follow up the chain, the song about trying to maintain control, with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the song about inviting Jesus to come and rescue. So we juxtaposed chains keep us together with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and ransom us and free us and save us. Do we choose to try to control or do we choose to surrender? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You're great and you're good and we love you. Thank you that you so loved the world that you gave us your one and only son to save us as we've remembered and celebrated this past week. And I pray that we would continue to remember and celebrate that because of Jesus, our hearts are free. Your grace is amazing, and your word secures our hope. We pray now that you would prepare us to hear from you. Speak through me, I pray. We give this time to you, and we pray that you would use it for your glory and for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name, we pray these things. Amen. Now, there's a popular phrase that I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. If I knew then what I know now, Obviously recognizing a choice that was made or could have been made with, now, with current knowledge should have been made differently and things would be a lot better. For example, if we'd foreseen how 2020 was going to go, we could have bought shares in Amazon or Zoom. Now, I'm not sure how much time monkeys spend regretting past decisions or thinking about them, but what I've learned about monkeys is how they are trapped. No, this wasn't an elective course at the seminary I'm studying at. I consulted YouTube. What I learned is that what monkey hunters do is they drill holes in coconuts just big enough for a monkey's hand to fit inside. And then they put a temptation inside like a small piece of fruit. And the monkey will smell the fruit, run to the coconut, insert his little hand into the coconut, and grab onto the fruit. But what happens is when the monkey's hand is inside the coconut, holding on to the fruit, he can't pull it back out again. And as the hunters come with the nets, the monkey freaks out, the monkey's dancing around, but not letting go of the fruit. If he would just open his hand, release the fruit, he'd be free to go. But he won't. He doesn't, and he's trapped. They're trapped because they refuse to let go. I wonder if the trapped monkey had known then what they know now, would they have released the item and preserved their freedom? This got me thinking, how much like a monkey am I? And can I suggest that we each ask ourselves that same question? And let's be honest with ourselves and ask, is there something or some things that we're hanging on to that have us trapped? Things that we're unwilling to let go of and release? What things are there that we we feel like we can't let go of, and why? A few weeks ago, I was chatting with Pastor Dave about what topic we should focus on this morning, and he suggested that I share some of, the, some of what I've been learning through the courses that I've been studying. Now, one class I finished just over a week ago is focused on understanding the Bible. We were assigned to read huge chunks of the Bible each week, and I learned more and more that this is an amazing book. I'm encouraged to know that so many of you are committed to daily Bible study. This book, this entire book, is a love story between God and humanity, and it ultimately centers around the person of Jesus Christ. And I gotta tell you, this story, this story is for you. And this story is for me. And this story is for us. This is a story that helps us to learn about God and learn how God, the one who gives us life, intends life to be lived, what we should prioritize and hold on to, and what we need to let go of. Now, I've owned a Bible for my entire life, and I've never been as enthused about it as I am right now. In Acts 4.12, we read that salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. True freedom is only found in the person of Jesus. And I've been learning so much more about what that freedom truly means. 
and how to live in that freedom and how to live out of that freedom. I've read and I'm learning to apply the scripture. There's a wise saying, the only knowledge that matters is applied knowledge, which in our context means that gaining scriptural knowledge is only valuable if we apply it to how we live our lives. Now, I can appreciate that some of the content in the Bible can be a bit tricky to understand. Believe you me, I'm going to be learning more and more about how to understand the Bible for as long as I have breath. And I think part of the reason for that, as J. Todd Billings suggests in his book, The Word of God for the People of God, is that the underlying theme of the Bible is this relationship between the Trinitarian God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and humanity. And it's really difficult to understand that relationship unless we are in that relationship. But as we surrender control and trust in the love of Jesus, we find that he is good. We find that we can trust him. And as we learn more and more about how we can trust Jesus, we're able to understand the Bible more and more and how we can apply it in our own lives. As we grow in our relationship with Jesus, our understanding of the Word of God increases as well. Now, a great opportunity that we have available to us, whether we're just newly interested in finding out about Jesus, or if we're, we're actually in that relationship and somewhere along the growth chart, is that Pastor Dave posts a Bible passage and an accompanying helpful explanation every weekday. Usually sometime before 9 a.m., Monday through Friday, my phone will bleep at me in a good way, And it says, your friend Dave Fields posted and rooted a scripture reading community. What a fantastic resource that we have access to. If you are already participating, if you aren't already participating, I can't emphasize enough how valuable the daily time in the word is, especially in a concert with a helpful explanation. You can find this scripture reading community on Facebook or through our website at summitdrive.com. And you can join in with us. Daily time in the word is so important and it's essential and doing it as part of a community is just so valuable. We'll talk more about the value of community in a few minutes. Now speaking of the Bible, I invite you to take yours and flip to the book of Philippians where we'll camp out. But be ready to jump around a bit as I tend to have a short attention span and who knows where we might end up. But we're going to focus on a phrase that I aspire to adopt as my life motto and mission. Free people, free people. So we're going to start with free people, and then we're going to move on to free people, just so you know. What does it mean to be free people? In our autumn sermon series, through the book of Acts, we heard the name Paul, formerly known as Saul, many times. He writes many of the books in the New Testament, including our primary focus today in Philippians, where he shows us a great example of what it means to live free, but maybe not necessarily how we typically might define free. In chapter 1 of Philippians, in verse 12, Paul writes, What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What has happened? Well, Paul is a prisoner. Again. You see, since he met the living Jesus, he realized that there's nothing else worth living for. So he devoted his entire life to knowing Jesus, to serving Jesus, and to sharing the good news about Jesus with as many people as he could. But not everyone was as receptive to the message of Jesus, and as a result, Paul Paul continued to face significant resistance, and he'd been imprisoned several times, which is where he is when he writes this letter to the Philippians. I'm not sure how many of us would positively respond to incarceration, but here, Paul isn't just bravely sucking it up, but interpreting his imprisonment as a good thing. And why? Because as a result of his captivity, the good news about Jesus was spreading further than it ever had before. And we see in verse 14 that many of his brothers and his sisters in the faith are inspired by him to more confidently proclaim the gospel without fear. So first, Paul shows us that despite the fact that he's a captive, he's actually free. Free from feeling bound, because his goal isn't to have the ability to do whatever he wants, to be in control. No, his goal is to be fully surrendered to Jesus and to see the good news spread. Now, as we continue through chapter 1, in verse 17, Paul states that there are some people who are preaching the gospel, but they're also maligning Paul's name. 
making them look bad. That's tough. I mean, for many of us, even if, we're no, even if we know we're in the wrong, we don't like having people drag our name through the mud. But what if we're trying to do what's right and people are going out of their way to make us look bad? Oof. But how does Paul respond? In verse 18, he says, what does it matter? The important thing is that Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So as a result of his commitment to the advancement of the gospel, he's in chains, but free. His good name is getting smeared, but he's not the least bit hurt. And as we continue to verse 21, he readily admits that for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now to give this some context, he is awaiting a trial that could conceivably result in his execution. And how concerned is he? Well, he says, if they let me live, I'll be able to share and show Christ to more people. And if they execute me, I'll be with Christ. Pretty much a win-win scenario. Ultimately, he is completely confident that God is taking care of him. He is living completely free. And what do free people do? That's right, free people, free people. And to that end, Paul reinforces the importance of unity, togetherness, community, prioritizing our relationships with one another, and not allowing differences, differences of opinion that we might have, to detract from spreading the gospel. Paul is well aware that how we relate to one another can be a great demonstration of the gospel, or not. He writes in chapter 1, verse 27, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of Christ. And then further down in verse 28, stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And over in chapter 2, in verse 2, he continues, Be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Challenging. Powerful something the world around us would likely notice. But we can't do this alone, can we? We need God's help. And thankfully, he is here to help us and help us remember that every person, every, per- every single person bears the sacred image of God. Every person bears the sacred image of God. That lady that cut me off in traffic, that guy that ridiculed me, And many of us can probably think of individuals who have done wrongs to us or others that make those examples seem like small potatoes. But what I remind myself is this. Free people, free people. If I harbor unforgiveness, I'm not free, and I'm not freeing. Now, I don't want want to make it seem like this is easy. If you're struggling to forgive someone who has wronged you, that you're abnormal or hopeless, And I trust that you'll offer me the same grace. In our human condition, even as we are being conformed to look more and more like Jesus, we are still fumbling our way around. We're fumbling our way forward by the help of God's Spirit, but we still struggle as we grow. All I'm saying is that this is where Jesus wants to lead us. In Matthew 10, verse 8, Jesus tells his followers, Freely you have received, now freely give. But I do know there are some things that are tough to forget. I want to tell you a story I recently heard on a podcast. Some of you are too young to remember, and some of us are old and find it hard to remember. But 26 and a half years ago, there was a mass genocide in the country of Rwanda where about half a million people were brutally killed. In the wake of this, the process began to try to rebuild the country and help people heal and move forward. A decision was made to allow those who had been imprisoned for murder, many of whom themselves were grief-stricken with the atrocities that they had committed, they were given the opportunity to confess, to repent, and to commit to being part of the rebuilding process. And if they agreed to this, their sentences would be reduced. And transformation villages began to be established, where survivors and repentant perpetrators would rebuild homes and communities together. Grace She was one of the survivors. She had lost her entire family and had been working through the grief and anger and the flood of other emotions as she began to rebuild her life 
and build a home in a transformation village. John ended up in the same village. John was the one who was responsible for the death of Grace's family. So at first they kept their distance from each other. But over time, they began to communicate. John helped Grace build her house, and Grace helped John build his. Through God's grace, they were able to reconcile. Grace was able to forgive John, and in time, John was able to receive forgiveness and forgive himself. Now, they consider each other family today, and Grace continues to help John understand the love and forgiveness of Jesus as she models it to him. This story is overwhelming to me. I look at my little grievances in a whole different light. But maybe some of you have faced some really severe injustice. And again, I'm not saying that it's easy. Just like it wasn't easy for Grace to forgive John. And undoubtedly, it wasn't easy for John to forgive himself or to receive Grace's forgiveness. But this is what Jesus is up to in the world. This is the way of Jesus. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is what Jesus is up to and what he wants to accomplish in your life and in my life. Now, I know a lot of us can't relate. We can't even begin to relate to the story of Grace and John, but here's maybe something a little more relevant. As many of you know, my brother, Kevin, died suddenly and unexpectedly just a few weeks ago. Recently, I was scrolling through my text conversations, and I opened my communication with him and was so thankful to read that one of the last texts I sent him said this, I'm proud of you. You know what that feels like to me now? Freedom. I recently chatted with a good friend who told me about the broken nature of his relationship with his brother, and I'm so thankful that I don't have to carry that as a burden. Now, to be honest, I didn't have to work hard to maintain a healthy relationship with my brother. It came pretty naturally, but I'm still so grateful. And I know that there are people who are much more difficult to maintain or to reestablish good relationships with. And there may be a number of instances where it seems impossible. We read in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's the expectation on us. We do all we can to live at peace with everyone. Then we are free. If we hold on to anger, and unforgiveness, our hands are stuck in the coconut. And we aren't modeling the gospel of Jesus in a way that frees people. I don't want to make this seem overly simple, but I can't overstate the importance of this either. If we flip over to Philippians chapter 3, in verse 17, Paul writes to his friends in Philippi and to us today, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Okay, whoa. I mean, Paul obviously has his walk with Christ together. And to us as Christians, it's interesting, and maybe even inspiring to read about, but he's way up there. He's this unattainable level of commitment, right? And I'm sad to say that sometimes that has been my thought about Paul and about other amazing examples of Christ-likeness. But in actuality, this is practical advice that can be really helpful to us if we are struggling to find freedom. Paul says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. This is directed to the church in Philippi, and this is directed to the church in Kamloops, and to you today, wherever you are. Paul continues, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. It's so important to have good role models and to work towards becoming a good role model. We'd love to help you find a good mentor and to grow as a mentor if that is something that you're interested in as we move into the new year. Paul goes on to say with tears in his eyes that many live as enemies of the cross. And that pattern of living, when your mind is set on earthly things, leads to destruction, like the monkey who won't let go. But Paul continues in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, at the time of receiving this letter, the people of Philippi had enjoyed the rights and privileges of being citizens of Rome for less than 100 years, and this was a pretty big deal for them. But Paul affirms that any advantages that Rome was offering them are not valuable at all in comparison to the surpassing greatness of the kingdom of heaven. And what Paul shows here is that heaven isn't this vague future promise that we will eventually experience, 
No, the kingdom of heaven is very much a reality that is meant to be taken a hold of and looked towards in a way that shapes our lives and our priorities today and tomorrow and every day. In his book, Discipleship on the Edge, Daryl Johnson writes, heaven refers to another dimension of reality that is right here, close at hand, all around us, intersecting the visible, tangible dimension. The kingdom is a present reality. And in Colossians 1.3, Paul says that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. But back to Philippians, as Paul finishes verse 20, he says, we eagerly await a savior from there, our Lord Jesus Christ. So for now, we still live in the not yet, but we can live confidently as citizens of what is to come. We live in a world still broken by sin, and we wrestle with it now. But what do we do in the time between the times? We still say, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And we keep our eyes fixed. We participate in something called target fixation, a concept that I was introduced to this week, which basically means you go where you look. Now, this idea is important when operating a motor vehicle. If you focus on the ditch, your vehicle will veer towards the ditch. If you focus on oncoming traffic, your vehicle's going to go in that direction. Bad idea. Similarly, we need to learn to focus on and to look at where we want to go, where God is directing us, and that will help us as we journey through the time between. So what are we looking at today? As 2020 comes to an end, do we find ourselves with our hands stuck in the coconut? Are we harboring unforgiveness? Or are we working towards restoring relationships? Paralyzed by fears that are holding us back? Or putting our faith in Jesus and letting him empower us and move us forward? Pastor Danielle Strickland shared something that she practices every morning where she physically prays. And she says, although my natural human posture is to fight for myself, to make something happen, I choose to surrender it to Jesus. And I know my natural posture is to take, to keep, to hold, to hang on. But I'm going to choose a posture of generosity with time and stuff. And also, be open to receive from others rather than a prideful tendency towards self-sufficiency. Receiving from others is very much a part of generosity, allowing other people to show their love for Jesus by giving. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus gives us these instructions on where to focus our attention. He says, seek first, focus on, look at the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his justice, his way of living, and go in that direction. He follows that up with the assurance that he'll look after providing us with everything we need. 1 Peter 2.16 says, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now, living free and living as a slave might not really add up in our minds, but things aren't necessarily as they seem. It's only when we surrender to God that we find true freedom. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What an encouragement that has been for me this past year in responding to weariness and to burdens. Finding rest for our souls in Jesus is so refreshing. One of my favorite songs from 2020 has a line that says, I think I've seen this film before, and I didn't like the ending. Just recently, I reread the end of the story, the end of our story. I reread the book of Revelation. And I did like the ending. It was good. It's really good. It turns out really well for us. Our team wins. Jesus has already secured the victory. And that is where true freedom lies. And the complete confidence that whatever happens, the outcome is already decided. Things are not as they seem. Yeah, there's tough stuff going on. There's an enemy, hard at work, trying to turn people away from the truth, turn people away from the light, from hope, trying to distract us with that sweet piece of fruit in hopes that we'll grab it tightly and be trapped. 
the things are not as they seem. In Revelation 4, we read, look, pay attention to this. There's a throne. Daryl Johnson says, there's a supreme headquarters, a seat of authority and power. And it's not way out there or way up there. It's right here. And look, someone is on the throne. In Revelation 4, 8, we are showing that who is on the throne? The Lord, God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then in Revelation 5, John, who had received and recorded the revelation, is told, look, the Lion of Judah has triumphed. And he looks back at the throne to see a lamb, a little lamb looking, at as, it, looking as it had been slain, standing on the throne. Not exactly the picture of power he was expecting, but the lamb has seven horns signifying perfect power and seven eyes signifying perfect wisdom. Jesus is the lamb that was slain and by becoming obedient to death, he is now the perfect Messiah, the Lion of Judah, victorious and majestic. As Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, starting at verse 6, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. And he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We know this. We have this information. So we won't have to say, if I knew then what I know now. Thank you, Jesus, that we know. And while we live in the not yet, we can look towards the what is to come and find assurance and hope as the Spirit of God moves us in that direction. The freedom that this provides is profound. This gives us a fearless focus on living in freedom in a way that provides freedom for others. Pastor Dave has recently referred to C.S. Lewis, Lewis' story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in the story, the creatures had all been turned into statues by the white witch. But the resurrected lion, Aslan, carries the children, Susan and Lucy, on his back and storms the witch's castle. As he breathes on a creature, it starts to come back to life. As the children look at the lion, their excitement about what is happening is overwhelming. And they search the entire castle and they find more and more statues. And they call to Aslan and again and again he comes. And as he breathes, the statues regain the life that they were intended to have. Isn't that beautiful? That excites me. The possibilities are endless for us. We live in a broken world, but look, the lion, look at the lion. Jesus is on the move and nothing will stop him. And we get to join in on his mission of freeing people introducing them to Jesus, and seeing him bring them to life. Let's think of strategies that we can employ that as we go into the new year. Now, things aren't ideal now, but we can remember the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.17, where he writes, Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We can regularly be encouraged by a description of what that future glory looks like by reading Revelation 21. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Lord, we echo the prayer of Paul for the Philippians, that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. The glory and praise of God. Jesus, as we prepare to enter a new year, would you help us allow room in our lives 
for more of you to fit in us. Help us to live in your freedom in a way that allows us to know you, to show your goodness to those around. Pray this in your precious name. Amen. Thanks, Geraldine. Invite you wherever you are now to, uh, to continue to engage with us and just to respond to this, saying thank you again to the one who is our God, the Lion and the Lamb.
free people, free people. Let's live as those freed people this week. For as Paul reminds us, we were called to this life of freedom. But don't use it to indulge your flesh, the things you want to do for your own self. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Jesus says, follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he also tells us that the truth, he himself, will set us free. And then we get to go on mission with him, as we heard today. So may that be true for us. May that be true for you. Amen.